Today, I know you're going to be encouraged. Would you stand to your feet today and let's welcome and honor Danielle Munizzi as she comes to bring the Word of God today. All right, church, you can be seated. Thank you so much. This morning, I'm going to um, just share a little bit about us, the series that we're in. Let's get here. This is the new podium. I haven't gotten to speak with the new podium. It's nice. It's nice. Like how many years, six years later, seven years later, we get something nice, y'all. All All right. So little things matter. You you never, you don't, you don't know until you're up here. Okay. Do I look good? The podium looks good. Am I in the right place? Everything's good. I didn't practice since podium. All right. So my name's Danielle, Uh, just a little bit about me really quickly if I haven't gotten the chance to meet you. Uh, I have the privilege of serving on staff here at Epic Life Church as our student director. Are any wildlifers in the room? I know a lot of them are serving in kids. Yes, yes. Hey guys, hi, hey, what's up? So I'm over wildlife and we have the best time every week. Um, And we hang out here on Sundays. Our special time together, our group, is during our 1130 service. Um, We head through the double doors and we have a really great time together. Um, And so some of you guys are like, wait, Danielle's here. Does that mean there's wildlife? I Don't tell any. Those of you that know the surprise, do not give it away. There's a surprise during second service. So the wildlife is still happening today. So, um, yeah, but anyways, we have a blast in wildlife. We have such a good time. And um, so this, these last several weeks, really since Easter, we've been in a series called The Fight. And it's been phenomenal. How many of you have been encouraged during these last several weeks? I know, like Pastor Martha said, Josh spoke last week and Pastor Martha has been sharing. And it's just been such a blessing to our church. And, and so today I'm going to share a little bit about The Fight um, from some of the things that God has put on my heart. And uh, But before I do that, I'm going to recap a little bit about the fight. So these last few weeks, right, we've talked about how life is like a fight. Amen, somebody, anybody, right? Life is like a, a fight, and, and it's often a battle because when life gets hard, what happens? We start to feel like we're losing. We start to feel discouraged, right? And, and it, life gets tough, right? We battle through situations. But this morning and, and what we've learned over these last several weeks, I'm here to remind you today that, that we're in a fixed fight, that we are victorious because we have Jesus Christ that is our sacrifice. He paid the full price of our sins. We're in a fixed fight. Church, this morning, we are the winners. We are the victors. And that's the place that we can uh, serve from. We can love others from, a place of victory and not defeat. God wants us to know, he wants us to learn that the victory is already won, right? The devil might fight us. He might throw things in our direction. But again, this is a fixed fight. So that means when the devil starts to throw things our way, it might knock us back, but it won't knock us down because God has already given us the victory. Is that encourage anybody this morning? Some of you, if you're like me, you just need to be reminded that I am victorious. I'm the head, I'm not the tail. I'm above only and not beneath. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am set free from the bondage of sin. I'm set free. The old has gone, new man has come. I'm a new creation in Christ. Is that for anybody today? You just need to remind yourself of the identity that we have through Christ Jesus. And that's what we've been talking about through this fight uh, series is is how God is asking us not to just fight aimlessly, kind of boxing in the air. No, he wants us to know that sometimes when we go through these situations, when we face battles, that we get to walk with him. We get to lean on him. We get to draw from the strength that is in, that what the strength that we have in Jesus Christ so that we fight from strength so that we fight from victory, so that we fight from uh, uh, the winner's seat, right? That's, that's the perspective that we have to be reminded of. And so I'm excited to share with you this morning a little bit about the fight. My take on it is a tiny bit different, um, just based on some of the recent things that have been happening in my life and the life of my family. Is that okay if I share a little bit uh, some of the things that are going on in, in our world? Um, so something that's happened recently is that my grandfather passed away last week and went to be with Jesus. 
And um, on Friday, we had a beautiful celebration service for him. And it was a really nice time to, to be together with family and friends and tell all the wonderful stories. Um, we call our grandfather Poppy. Um, one of the first grandkids couldn't say grandpa, so she said Poppy. Um, and so you'll hear me call him Poppy. That's who he is. So um, it, it's, it's also incredibly very <laughs> difficult. It's very sad. Um, because life is now going to be forever different and we'll never be the same without Poppy in here um, with us. And so, um, yeah, but we got to reminisce and spend time with family. And I was just so blessed to see all of his brothers and sisters. My Poppy is one of nine siblings. And um, so we got to hear just different perspectives and the grandkids shared, the sib- his kids shared, and Pastor Dan shared a beautiful eulogy and and um, it was just a beautiful time together. And, um, you know, a few months ago, when his health started to really decline, I really started to, to take everything in, take stock of, of the role that Poppy played in my personal life um, and the person that I am today. Um, and, you know, in the last few years, we knew that Poppy's health was declining, so we spent even more time with him. And I remember um, last year on his birthday, um, we sat around the table and uh, our family is so big and man, it's, there's so many special things I could say about Poppy and about grandma who's still with us. Thank you, Jesus. We were so grateful. She's in good health and she looks good and she feels good. Uh, but at Poppy and grandma's house, you know, the, there's so many kids that every time somebody, you know, we have a kid, we have to add tables to the room. So if, you're, if you could kind of envision it, there's, there's the main table and there's another setup table and then there's like a ping pong table and then there's like a random patio table and it just goes straight down the room. And we got to sit all the way around the table and honor Poppy while he was still with us, while he was still aware and tell him that we loved him and that we thanked him for, for the model that he was, the example that he set before us. And I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that we honored him while he was still here on the earth. So everything that we shared on Friday, we had already said straight to his face where he embraced it. But what's so beautiful about Poppy, and this is just a little bit of context for those of you who never got a chance to know him, um, Poppy was one of the greatest encouragers you've ever met in your life. Totally like, it was like relentless encouraging. You're awesome. You're, you're anointed. You did so great. You look so good. He called me Nicole Miss America. Every time he'd say, look how beautiful you look, Miss America, Miss America too. And, and, um, and he would, he'd sat over in that. For those of you that um, only started coming since the pandemic, they stopped coming around the time the pandemic started. Um, But prior to that, they came every single Sunday, the first service and sat right in that area. And I made it a a beeline to them every Sunday just to hug them, tell them I love them. And um, and I'm just so grateful. I'm devastated. We're brokenhearted. It won't be the same. But today I'm, I'm so grateful of the legacy the legacy that I'm a part of, the legacy of our family and the legacy of, of our faith and what that has done for our family uh, because our family's not perfect. Our family has gone through a lot of hard stuff just like you have, I'm sure. Um, and we are just so blessed to have had a patriarch and a godly man um, like Poppy, like Dominic Minizzi. And so um, a little bit about... Um, me and, and I'm going to share a couple of stories, so kind of track with me here. Um, but this week, while we were reminiscing about all of the funny stories about Poppy's house, I could literally tell you dozens of stories. Poppy's house um, was just the party house. It was set up for his grandkids. It was all. It was primed and ready for Christmas. Primed and ready for parties. It was just the best, most ideal. Um, destination for all the grandkids. And, um, you know, growing up, my parents worked a lot. Uh, Our childhood was actually pretty unique. I don't know if I've shared this before, um, but our parents traveled a lot for work and it was really hard. They hated leaving us so much. I know it was really hard for them to to, to leave us and not feel bad about it, but they really did work so hard to, to give us the best, to give us a great childhood. And so as kids, we stayed with our grandparents a lot with Grandma Faith and Grandpa Bud, and then we would stay a lot with Poppy and Grandma. And um, staying at Poppy's house was so fun. And now, now that I'm, you know, 29 years old and I look back, um, if, if it wasn't for my parents working and traveling and leaving us, I wouldn't have the incredible fond memories with Poppy that I do have. 
And so it's just funny how that works out. You know, in hindsight, you're like, I miss my mom. When you're, you know, seven, you're like, I miss my mom. And now that I'm an adult, I'm like, man, what a precious time in my life that I got to spend all that time with my grandparents and glean, and I just have the most fabulous, right? We have the best memories. We have the best memories with our grandparents, and so thanks for going away and dropping us off and leaving us there. Yeah, that's him right there. That's him mid-song. Um, yeah, he's also a, a, a worship leader, right? Back in the day, they called that song leader. So there would be somebody that would stand behind the pulpit and lead the congregation in song. And that was Poppy and, and his wife, Carmen, my grandma. They were always in the worship department. Um, and we got to um, learn from him. He would always teach us new songs. He would teach us old songs. I think some of them he made up. Some of them, he added his own verses. Um, and uh, so, yeah, just beautiful memories like that. He was a godly man. He was always talking about faith. He was quoting scripture all the time, talking to us about the Holy Spirit. He often talked about supernatural things. It was very commonplace for Poppy to be talking about miracles, to talk about angels, to talk about things like, um, let's see, there's so many stories um, how... I remember there's a story, I think it's about his family, how when they were in Italy, because before they came to America, he was raised in Sicily, and the Germans were bombing where his family lived, and there's a famous story um, where they ran to a corner of the house while bombs were falling all around them, and they began to pray to God and pray for God to rescue them and save them. And the end of the story is that the rest of the house all around them came crumbling down except for the corner of the home that they were standing in. And so there were beautiful stories and testimonies just like that, stories of my poppy seeing angels, having God encounters. It was just commonplace. It wasn't spooky. It wasn't, you know, uh, oh, the Holy Spirit and be careful. It wasn't anything like that. It was just commonplace and, and normal to talk about God. And there were so many stories like this, but he was always quoting scripture. I felt comfortable coming to him. And my grandma, they were so patient while I asked all my nine-year-old questions, my 10-year-old questions. And um, I have another story I've shared before that I was filled with the Holy Spirit at nine years old. And when I say that I was filled with the Holy Spirit to the extent of speaking in tongues and even a little bit of interpretation, I don't know how that happened, at nine years old, and I had a real God encounter for the first time. Now, I was in my house, uh, my parents' house, when I was nine years old, I was with them. And I was not in a conventional church setting. Um, I haven't encountered God in a conventional church setting. But for me, that was a very unique experience to encounter the Holy Spirit outside of church. I was always in church growing up. I was always in, in services and different things like that. So what I haven't shared about that time in my life is that that was also the season that I was staying with my grandparents a lot. And in Poppy and Grandma's living room at the end of the house, there's this little baby grand um, that my grandma plays so beautifully. And I remember that was around the time I wanted to learn how to play piano. And so I remember I had recently been filled with the Holy Spirit. So I felt kind of weird. I don't know how else to say it, right? When, when you have an encounter like that, it kind of changes everything. It changes your perspective. It kind of makes you feel a little bit different. And so I remember being 10 and 11 and playing the piano and my grandma would show me all these chords and different inversions and different things. And I just, I was so blessed to have learned that from her. And I remember one story in particular. It's, such, it's the most, uh, I'm just so blessed. I'm so blessed. And I remember there was a time I was sitting at the piano and I was so annoying. Let me just say this. I had to be the most annoying because I played for hours or what felt like hours, playing the wrong notes, playing the wrong thing. So it's not like listening to somebody practice and get their repetitions in and like, oh, that sounds, it's like plug your ears, turn the TV volume up loud. And it's a, it was an acoustic piano. It's a, it's a baby grand. So the thing is loud. The living room is all one big room. And they were so patient. They were so patient with me. And I remember the song that I was trying to learn that day was, you are great, you do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. You deserve the glory and the honor for we lift our hands in worship. And I remember as I played that song for like 45 minutes, <laughs> over and over and over, I began to have another experience with God. 
I was worshiping my 10 or 11 year old self. And I remember it so vividly, feeling that sensation, feeling like that awareness, that reverence. God, I, f- I feel your presence here. And I remember not wanting to like draw a bunch of attention, but I started to cry and kind of, you know, sort of playing a little bit softer. I remember in that moment, Poppy walked over to me and I thought he would be, you know, console me or is everything okay? I see Poppy would do, what happened? Why are you crying? Oh no, who hurt you? Uh, As Poppy would often do, but that's not what Poppy did at all. He came over and started worshiping with me and started singing and we worshiped God together. And Poppy had an awareness of the presence of God. And it was just the best thing for me to feel. I felt comforted. I felt seen. But I also felt uh, like there was an example before me and how to kind of just take a moment, a holy moment, and embrace the presence of God in that room, in that living room at a young age. It also reinforced um, the, the, the idea that I had that God was with me at all times. He was not just with me when I prayed before dinner. He was not just with me in Sunday school and in youth group like I wasn't at the time. God was not just with me whenever I was praying, you know, before bedtime. No, God was with me at all times. His spirit was living within me and, and it helped me to, to, to be aware of what God, of God was doing. It helped me be aware of what God was saying. And, and so those are just some beautiful memories that I have with God. But I remember just feeling kind of different like like set apart and poppy and grandmother and my all of my grandparents they were like my besties when i was 10 years old <laughs> because I, it was hard how do you relate to other 10 and 11 year olds they're not they're not talking about god we're talking about in sync <laughs> and we're talking about did you see american idol last night how, who did you vote for who did you I, you voted for like there was just nothing else and i'm like can we talk about the holy spirit i want to tell you a story about how my poppy saw an angel when their whole family was broken and desperate and lost and i was just it just made me so i was like an outcast i felt so different but i i, I wasn't insecure about it i was proud i was excited i was passionate i, I love the lord i wasn't you know super articulate or or a you know, an expert in, in the faith or in scripture by any means at all. But I was really passionate and excited and hungry for God. And a lot of you, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you weren't nine, maybe you weren't 10, but when you first came into relationship with Christ, right? It looked a little bit like that. You were excited, right? You were filled with passion. You, you came to church every week. You went to a group every, your Bible study every week. You auditioned for the worship team, right? You, you got involved and you were serving, right? So maybe for some of you, you, you had a dramatic transformation. You had a, a true God encounter and experience in your life. Some of you, you got rid of all the secular music. Anybody do that? You, you stopped listening to secular music and you started listening to Christian music, right? And that was a big deal. Not everybody does that. That's a big deal. You get a lot of good Christian heaven points for that. You do. Some of you, it was extreme. You walked away from a life of addiction. You said no to to partying. You said no to being in in certain environments, to going to nightclubs and being around an atmosphere where you're just thinking about yourself and and everything is hypersexualized and everything is about substances. Some of you, you walked away from like real addictions and you said, God, I'm, I'm trusting you to break these things off of my life. And you had a true transformational experience, right? And those are beautiful times. Those are beautiful memories that we have with God. But today the message, the the theme of today is the fight. And that's what we're talking about here today. And what can often happen is that when, when we have those experiences, right? What happens? Life goes on. Time passes. And we start to experience real life. Maybe something happens and those old friends that we walked away from start to come back around. And we love them, right? We love them with the love of Christ, right? And we don't wanna offend anybody, so maybe we start hanging out with them a little bit more. We think maybe I can be the good influence on them, maybe I can influence them, right? And then you kinda start to take steps backward, away. The fight that you had in the beginning of your transformation experience, the the passion that you had when you first came to know Jesus starts to fade just a little bit. 
Or maybe you're one of those people that you, you know, secular music was a trigger for you. I hear that all the time. People that come from a, a, a you know, a, an intense worldly experience in nightlife, in the club, where everything is, it's not just music and dancing. No, it's so much more. It's consuming. It's the environment. It's the people. It's, it's, the, it's the thoughts that come with, with that environment. And what happens? Somebody's throwing a party. It's at my cousin's house. I have to go, Right? And you just kind of find yourself in these environments and you, you don't fight as hard as you used to. And you kind of slip back a little bit. And the things that you kind of were pushing up against, you started to embrace. Why? I'm a Christian. I've been, I've been doing a lot. I've been, wor- I've been working real hard. I pray all the time. I give, I tithe, I serve. What's, what's, what's the harm? For some of us, we slip back into addiction. Because addiction is, is really a disease for many people, for most. And we relapse. What happens when people relapse? Shame, guilt. And in a moment, they feel like everything they've worked so hard for is undone, one false swoop. So it's just easier what? To go backwards, to stop fighting, to pull away, to feel discouraged. And the passion that we once felt starts to fade away. And I know all of our stories in this room today are different, and I can relate to that. In these last few months, six months, really, I've, I've realized that I've started to feel kind of like, okay, God, you know, where is my passion? How, how could I define the, the excitement that I have? Am I still excited? You know, and, and one of the thoughts that I've been doing some research on is just this idea of, of apathy, Apathy. We, apathy is that idea of what's the point, right? I'm not really interested like I once was. That's what happens to us. When, when we pull back from our fight, those thoughts kind of creep in. I've already messed up, so they're inviting me to go out again. What's the big deal? I'll just go out. I'll be at church on Sunday, so I'll just work it out, drink a ton of water, and make, be at church on time. Right? Can we be honest? That's what happens all the time. What's the point? I've already kind of messed up. So what's one more, you know, bad decision? What's one more bad video that makes me feel bad, but it makes me feel good in the moment? What's one more hit of this substance, this drug? What's one more thing? I'm already kind of spiraling down. I'm already kind of feeling weak. I'm already kind of feeling vulnerable. So what's the point? Let me just do it one more time, one more time. And we pull away. We stop fighting. Apathy is the enemy of our fight. Apathy is the true enemy, what I believe. It's the enemy of the next generation of Gen Zs. It really is. Because what is the point, right? I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday and I fight apathy, right? What's the point? What's the point anymore? You know, nothing, everything's crazy, but mine's like the charismatic Pentecostal version of apathy. This is my version. God's coming back to get us. So what's the point? The rapture is soon coming. There's, everything's about to change. The world is falling apart. Going to hell in a handbasket. So what's the point? That's still apathy. Yeah. <laughs> That's still hopelessness. That's still faithlessness. Yeah. That's still, you know, what's, I'm giving up. I, I'm, I'm not fighting like I, I should. Well, what does the Bible say about fighting? Our scripture in Ephesians, which has been our, our scripture for this entire series is this. Ephesians 6, 12, if you're writing notes down or if you're, you got your Bibles, you can read along with us also on the screen. It says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Church today, you are not in a battle of the natural. You're in a supernatural fight. You're in a spiritual battle. We might be fighting in the natural world with practical tools, but we ultimately must understand that we're not natural beings having a supernatural experience, but we are supernatural beings having a natural earthly experience. It's a mindset shift. 
It's a perspective shift. But if we don't fight to keep the perspective of the word of God, what the word of God is saying, that we can't fight each other and we can't even fight ourselves, but we must step into the right fight, knowing that there's an enemy out there that wants to steal, steal, kill, and destroy you, steal your future, rob you of your hope. And ultimately he wants to see you dead. He wants to see you lost. That's not to scare you, but that's to make you aware. So we're enlightened to this. When we understand what this is saying to us in Ephesians, we know that the legacy of a believer means that I'm not fighting with my fists. I'm not fighting with my emotions. I'm not fighting with my flesh. I'm not fighting with my brother or my sister. I'm not fighting with my pastor or my small group leader. I'm not fighting with even just even my flesh, but I'm in a spiritual battle and I cannot give up. I'll never give up. I'll never back down. I won't give up on myself. I won't give up on my neighbor. I won't give up on my relationship with God. I won't give up on my spiritual maturity. I won't give up on spreading the hope and the light of the world. I won't give up on giving people a message of hope and love. I won't give up on giving people a sense of identity, a sense of purpose. I'll never stop fighting. I'll never back down. I'll never lose sight of the price that Jesus paid on the cross for me. I will never stop fighting for what God has done in my life. Amen, church? So these are the three things I want to quickly talk about. Legacy. I was talking about legacy earlier. The legacy of a believer is something that I've been thinking about recently. I've been thinking about my legacy, the, the legacy of my Munizzi family, of my Frederick family. On my dad's side, on Poppy's side, it goes back, I think, five generations of charismatic, of, of Pentecostal, as we say in New York, Pentecostal preachers, Christians. As far back as great, 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 great grandfather, was excommunicated from the Catholic Church because he believed in this, the spirit and the power of God <laughs> and helped found the first Pentecostal church in Sicily. Yeah, yeah. So I've got roots down deep. Yeah. I, I've got a reason to stand here today boldly and confidently. If you are a newbie, if you are a baby Christian, if you're a first generation convert, let me encourage you today. There is a spiritual legacy for you. Yeah. There is a spiritual inheritance for you, starting with you, beginning with you here in the house today. You don't have to be just like me with four and five generations of believers, four and five generations of Christians. No, you have the one true ambassador, Jesus Christ who went to the cross for you. He is your legacy. He is your, he is your brother. He is the one who went to the father for you. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. You don't need another book. You don't need another self-help. You don't need another counseling session. All of those things are great and help and they assist, but the only thing you need is to get focused on the thing that Jesus has already done for you so that you can fight from a place of victory, so that you're able to fight from a place of strength, not for strength, not for victory, but from it. Amen, church? So these are the Quickly, very, very quickly. This, these are some of the thoughts that I've been thinking about. The legacy of a believer. There are so many more, but I'm going to give you three today. Is that okay? If you're taking notes, you can write this down. The legacy of a believer. The first uh, part of that legacy is that we are set free. The legacy of a believer, it means that we are set free. Totally free. We're born into sin. We're born into imperfection. With Christ, we are totally set free, completely free. Yes. Just take that in just for a moment. We are free. Look at your neighbor and say, we're free. We're free. We're free. Look at your other neighbor and say, with Christ, we're free. With Christ, we're free. Now put your hand over your heart and say, I am free. I am free. I am free. Without Christ, we live under a curse, under the law. We need to be reconciled with God. On our own, we are imperfect. We are selfish and we are lost. Many of us in the room today, we're here because we're looking to be found. We're looking to be rescued from our situation. We're looking to be rescued from our current state of living. You're, there's things that you're doing. There's things that are a part of your lifestyle that you don't want to carry into the future. You wanna be free from things. Church, can I encourage you today? Jesus Christ has paid the price and you are set free. You are already free. You are free. The only perfect, sin, per, perfect sinless person who ever lived was who? Jesus. 
it was Jesus, right? He was fully man, but I want you to catch this. He was also fully God. The Bible says, so he who knew no sin became sin, right? That's what it says in Romans. Oh, sorry, in 2 Corinthians, I went too far. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, sin separates us from God. It's a barrier. When we read the story of Jesus dying on the cross, this verse, this is what happens. He who knew no sin, he became sin. And so as Jesus is hanging there and dying, he is taking on every sin. As he's, lay, he's hanging on the cross and his body is starting to give way, it's giving way to the, to the, to the uh, wages of sin, which is death. That's what's happening to his body. It's breaking down because this sin is killing him physically. Bible says that the father actually turned his face from Jesus, not because he was mad at Jesus or upset, but because there's a barrier that sin creates. And in that moment, that's what Jesus was experiencing, that the father turned his face away for that moment. But how many of you know that when Jesus died, he rose again on the third day so that we can have full communion with God, so that we could have a personal relationship with him, so that when we felt separated from him and our sin, we repent, we turn from our wicked ways, and we turn back towards the Father where he's already looking towards you. He's already gazing upon you, wanting to have a relationship with you. He's already looking at you ready and waiting, and he's saying, come, turn from your old ways, and come or I'm gonna give you new life. Amen? Amen. But let's get a little more specific here. What are we set free from? Why do I need to be set free? In Romans 7, Paul famously talks about, you know, the law and, and our sin nature, right? He tells us about how we need God's help because we are bound to our flesh and our sin nature. We are, as, as humans made of flesh, there is a bondage there. But in Romans uh, 7, he says this, we've all heard this before, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, that's what I do. What is that about? Right there, that's a little snapshot of what it's like when we're battling our flesh. I want to do better, but I mess up. I I want to do the right thing, but why am I still doing the wrong thing? I know it's wrong, but here I am still doing the wrong thing. The next chapter in Romans 8, he explains this and he gives the answer to this sin problem. Romans 8 verse 3, he says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, Jesus, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God's law, it's like a magnifying glass. Some of us, we kind of look at the Old Testament and we're like, okay, that's the Old Testament. That's the Old Covenant. No, we need it. We need to know. We need to understand what the Old Testament says. It shows us our depravity. It shows us our need for a savior. It shows us how imperfect we really are. It shows us how on left on our own, we destroy us ourselves and we destroy our family. Church, look at the children of Israel. They kept complaining, God kept providing, and they kept getting apathetic. God kept providing and rescuing them, and they kept complaining and said, well, what about this? What about that? God gave them food. Well, well we want this instead. Well, he delivered them out of slavery. Well, we, we liked it better back there because we were comfortable and life was normal. But God is, is, is saying, if, if there's anything in the way, I want to get it out of the way. And when you read the Old Testament, you see that from the from the. Adam and Eve, to Abraham, to the children of Israel, all the way fast forwarded to when Jesus was sent to the cross to die. All the Father wants to do, the the main thing, his greatest desire is that you would choose to have a relationship with him. That's why we have free will. He keeps letting us decide. (laughs) He keeps letting us choose even when we don't choose him. He keeps asking us to make a decision. He keeps offering us another chance. You didn't choose me last time, but will you choose me this time? You didn't didn't pick me last time, but will you choose me this time? You walked backwards into into slavery, but will you choose freedom this time? That's the heart of the Father. We are set free. We are set free. The next thought is this. We are made new. We are made 
new. This is where I wanna shake the shoulders of a few of us in here today that might be battling apathy. I feel like the spirit is kind of shaking my shoulders a little bit. If you're here today and you're losing hope, you're losing interest, you're kind of just checked out, I, can I encourage you today? Just don't, it doesn't have to be this whole kumbaya, rocking and worship thing, or God, I need you to make me new. Can I just, just share this with you today? Hit the reset button. Just start over. You're made new. You are a new creation. If you need to be made new once a week on Sunday, then be made new once a week on Sunday. If you need to be made new every single day, every single morning, God's word says that there are mercies for you every single morning. Hit the reset button. You are a new creation. Our, our, we're, like I shared with you before, we're bound to our sin nature. That means we have to stay in the fight. That means we cannot disengage. That means we cannot lose interest. That means that every day we need to fight that spiritual fight that says, again, I'm the head of God, I'm not the tail. I'm above only, I'm not beneath. The old man has gone, the new man is here. God, you've made me new. I'm fighting apathy. I'm staying engaged. I'm locking into what you have for me. God, I know there's a purpose and a plan that you have for my life. God, even though I don't see it, even though I don't feel it, even though I don't sense it, even though all of those around me are insecure and doubting you and questioning you and walking away, God, I'm staying in the fight and I'm trusting you. I'm trusting that today, God, you'll make me over. You'll make me new. You'll give me a fresh start. God, I need your new mercies. God, give me your new mercies. Some of us in the room, you just need that, that, that resuscitation of your, of your spirit today. Second Corinthians says this five, second Corinthians five. Do we have that? Yes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That was God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting the people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Some of us need to reconcile this in our hearts today. You have the ministry of reconciliation. That means you need to reconcile your heart. Walk out of shame. Walk out of the old life. Walk away from the old habits that stole your joy, that stole your energy, that stole your, your expectation for your future and for your life and to step into the new and allow God to reconcile all of the things that you can't reconcile on your own. That's how we stay in the fight. When we lean into that, that's what this says here on the cross. Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Church, ultimately, is that not what Christ did for us? But he hung there and he died and reconciled us back from the Father to us. That's the ability that we have. That's the legacy of a believer. That's what happens when you stay in the fight. You, you're, you allow yourself to be in a position where you can actually be made new. Church, if we are not allowing our lives to be totally set free, to be delivered from our past, to be totally repentant of our sin, we can't be made new. But church today, the legacy of a believer is that when you fight and you, and you say no to your flesh, you say no to your old self, God will make you new. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. I've been reading recently about uh, this author and, and speaker, his name is John Piper. He talks a lot about Christian hedonism. And this is very interesting. I think you'll find this very interesting. Hedonism, let's talk about hedonism first. Anybody know what hedonism is? Hedonism is the pursuit of pleasure, a sensual self-indulgence, right? It's this philosophy that says, Whatever brings me the most pleasure is the highest good that I can do. Sound familiar? <laughs> the thing that brings me the most pleasure, whatever makes me the most happy is my best self. That's when I'm at my best. That's when I can contribute the very best to the rest of humanity. That's what hedonism is. John Piper talks about Christian hedonism. And he says this, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Yeah. Wow. Wow. 
This is the legacy of a believer. When we're satisfied in Christ, we're able to endure the fight. When we're satisfied in Christ, we're able to have the, the right perspective in every situation and say, man, this is hard. But God, if this brings you glory, God, this is painful. I don't know what you're doing, but God, I want you to get the glory out of this situation. God, I feel discouraged. I feel pulled backwards into my old ways, into my old addictions. God, I need you to give me the strength. God, because I know you're going to get the glory out of this. I want to make you proud. I want people to see your hand at work in my life. God, this is really, really hard, Lord, but I'm, I'm most satisfied, Lord, when you're getting the glory, when you're at work in my life. If you're looking for satisfaction, fulfillment today, some of you, you just needed this right here. Allow God to bring glory to your life. Allow God to bring glory to your situation. Allow Him to be glorified. How do you do that? Share your faith. Invite people to church. Talk about the good things that God is doing in your life. Focus on the positive. Focus on faith. Read scriptures about hope. Read scriptures about the future. Read the prophetic books. Read the books of wisdom and the Bible that give you something to hold on to, that give you hope, that give you a purpose. And watch God bring in that sovereign fulfillment, not just a fading feeling, but a true meaning of life that you feel like, okay, I'm here for a purpose. There's a plan for my life because God's getting the glory. That's right. It's a heavenly perspective. It's a heavenly shift. The last thought is this, the legacy of a believer, we are eternal. We're eternal, we're eternal beings. Did you know that church? That's right. That's right. Eternity is too real for us to come here every Sunday and just kind of gloss over that fact. Now we create space and opportunity every single week for you to hear the message of the gospel, not just so that you could live a better life here on earth, but the, so that you could spend eternity with the Father. Hell was not meant for humans, but is, it's, it's where sin goes. It's the price, it's the wage of sin. I was talking a little bit earlier about sin and the law and how law the law is like a magnifying glass to our sin, to our sin nature, right? Don't eat this, don't do that. Wives do this, husbands do that, kids do that. Don't eat the shrimp, eat the shrimp. You can have the shrimp. In the New Testament, it's okay. No, it's not. What's the law? What does that mean? What covenant are we in? And we just kind of get in, lost in these theological opinions and perspectives. And some of us are right, and some of us have no idea what we're talking about. And we just kind of get caught up in the conversation, right? And that's okay. But church, don't ever let that distract you from the main thing. The main thing is that there is an eternity. Your earthly body will fade away and your soul will either go to heaven or to hell. That's not doom and gloom, but it's the gospel, right? The gospel means there's good news. <laughs> so the good news is that there's an opportunity here while you're on this earth to live and walk and spend eternity with God the Father and with God the Son. That's where Poppy is today. I believe in Hebrews. I'm a, I'm a literal Hebrews person, so I really do believe that there's a great cloud of witnesses and that Poppy is peering over the balcony in heaven watching us have our services today. I really do. <laughs> Encouraging us with Grandpa Bud and with all of our family that are there and so many of your relatives. We were, I was talking about that last week. I'm like, I think, I wonder, are all of our, all of our parents, all of our grandparents kind of like elbowing each other in heaven? Like, do you say, that's mine, that's my kid, that's my grandson, that's my granddaughter. There is an eternity, church. Heaven is for real. <laughs> and as believers, we make a decision to step into eternity with Christ. Non-believers, you have not yet made that decision. If you are stuck in sin and you have unrepentant sin, you have not yet made that decision to step into eternity with Christ. I wanna make myself very clear this morning. I wanna bring this to your attention so that you're fully aware. Sin separates us from God. We see that time and time again throughout the scripture. But God's response 
to that unrepentant sin is to extend another opportunity for us to remove sin, to remove the barrier so that we could come into right standing with Him. We read that before in, in uh, 2 Corinthians that He has made us His righteousness. And for those of you in the room this morning, you've not yet made that decision. I wanna encourage you, we're gonna pray in a few moments to make that decision. I hope this encourages you today because life gets hard. There is loss, there is pain, but also life is short. <laughs> it's so short, it's a blink. It's a vapor, the Bible says. It's so important that the decisions that you're making now, you understand the legacy that you're leaving behind you. My apathy was, like I was saying before, God's coming back, so what's the point? Well, what if I'm wrong? What if I have kids and they have kids and they have kids and there's five, 10 more generations before the Lord comes back to get us all? What legacy am I leaving for them? What seeds am I sowing now? What seeds am I sowing today? What roots am I putting down in this moment? What defines me? Who defines me? Is it my circumstance? Is it my pain? We, I mean, we could all share stories of our grandparents and great grandparents of going through wartime, going through famine, going through a great depression, and they still held the faith and kept strong. And look at our generation right now. People are deconstructing, walking away completely from God, questioning if God was ever real, questioning their whole upbringing in church. Church, what is that? That's the enemy of apathy. That's the enemy using apathy to steal your faith to steal your identity in Christ. I don't know about you church, but no one can steal my identity in Christ. No one and nothing can separate me from the love of God, nor height, nor depth, no nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And I would implore you today, if that's a, a place that you've been in, you've been in apathy, you, you can step out of that. If you've been in, in unbelief, you can step forward and step out of unbelief into faith. If you've been in addiction, in bondage, in uh, the bad situations that you wanna step out of, church, today, step out of. Take a step, take one step. With all heads bowed and across the room, eyes closed, I'm gonna pray for you. I wanna pray that you would make a decision, my desire, that you would make a decision to, to walk in faith, maybe greater faith, maybe for the first time, you wanna pray that salvation prayer. And if that's you in the room today, I, I just, I know you know this, but I wanna make sure, guys, heaven is for real. Hell is a real place. God gave us the good news of the gospel. He sent his son, Jesus. The Bible says, how will they know if we don't preach? How will they know if we don't tell them? And church, I'm here to tell you today, Get your heart right with the Father. Get your heart right with God. Accept Jesus. Turn from your wicked ways. Repent. Leave it behind. Don't try to understand it. Don't try to make it make perfect sense. Why did I do this? Why was I raised like that? What happened to me? Church, can I encourage you? God is a healer. He's a comforter. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit can comfort you. There's so many things that are available to you when you step into new life with Christ. All across this room, heads still bowed, eyes closed. If you wanna make that decision today and you're saying, yeah, that's me. I wanna get my heart right with God. I wanna have a better life. I wanna be free. I wanna step into a godly legacy. I wanna be free from bondage. And I want God to make me new. If that's you in the room today and you're saying, God, I want you to come into my heart and make me new. God, I want you to save me. I want you to wash me clean. If you're in the room today and you're saying, I wanna have a relationship with the Savior. I wanna know Him. I wanna feel His presence. I wanna hear His voice. If that's you in the room today with no one looking around, would you just slip your hand up so that I can know who I'm praying for? Yes, 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 yes. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. I'll wait a few more second, seconds. If there's anybody else, I'm gonna pray for you. We'll include you. Yes, awesome. You can put those hands down. Church, can we pray this prayer together and no one praying alone? You can repeat after me. Say this, say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you today. 
Forgive me of my sins. Wash me with your blood. I believe you died for me. And on the third day, you rose again. Right now, I believe that my sins are forgiven, that I'm justified by your blood, that I'm born again, that I am saved. Come on, that I am a child of God. I am free from the power of sin. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, come on, can we put our hands together for all the decisions? Hands went up today. A lot of hands went up today. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.